Welcome to the Free Library of Philadelphia. My name is Laura Kovacs, and I'm honored to introduce our guests this evening. Yi Yun Lee's debut fiction collection, A Thousand Years of Good Prayers, won the Frank O'Connor International Short Story Award, the Penn Hemingway Award, and the Guardian First Book Award. Her other work includes the novel, The Vagrants, the story collection, Gold Boy, Emerald Girl, and the memoir, Dear Friend, From My Life, I Write to You in Your Life. The recipient of a MacArthur Fellowship, Guggenheim Fellowship, and the Wyndham Campbell Prize, she teaches writing at Princeton University. Her new novel is The Book of Goose. Elizabeth McCracken's seven books include Bowl Away, The Giant's House, Thunderstruck and Other Stories, and The Souvenir Museum, a story collection that was long listed for the National Book Award. Currently the James Mishner Chair for Fiction at the University of Texas at Austin, her many honors include the Penn New England Award, three Pushcart Prizes, and an O. Henry Prize. Her new book is titled, The Hero of This Book. Please join me in welcoming our guests to the stage. Hi, I'm so happy to be here with you. Oh, thank you. Um, and we, we decided that we would read a little bit to start. Um, it's a very tall podium, really. <laughs> um, uh, and then I'll read first, and then we're, we, we know each other quite well. Oh, yes. Yeah. So we're going to sit and just talk to each other and then take questions afterwards. And so I'm reading just the second um, small chapter of this book, which came out on Tuesday. Um, and uh, the, the nice thing is you don't need to know anything before I read this about the book. Because I know that when I read, um, when I'm sitting listening to novels, when, for some reason when somebody, it's like if the waiter brings you a plate and says, don't touch it, the plate is very hot, I just automatically touch it. And when somebody says to me, this is all you need to know about this novel, I think, no, I'm not going to pay attention because because I'm perverse. Everything makes more sense if you know what my parents looked like. My father was six foot three and for the last 40 years of his life, enormous in every dimension, 300 pounds or more. Photos reveal that he was relatively thin for the early parts of my childhood. This father, the one with a mustache and plenty of sandy blonde hair, has been replaced in my head by the white-bearded fat father, the one children on the street mistook for Santa Claus, which he enjoyed as long as a nearby parent didn't say, you better be good or he won't bring you any presents. He was mostly shy. Some people were frightened by his size and silence. In my childhood, I sometimes was. He had a stutter and a temper and an encyclopedic memory, a capacious metaphorical heart and an enlarged anatomical one. He didn't take care of himself. His eyes were large and very blue. You couldn't tell exactly how many teeth he'd lost to neglect. I don't remember him ever going to a dentist because his beard hid it. My mother was less than five feet tall, walked with canes during my childhood, had tarnished black hair she wore in a bun, was talkative, had black eyebrows even when her hair had gone mostly white, was olive-skinned, she said that wherever she went, she met lonely men who mistook her for a countrywoman, spoke Turkish and Spanish and Urdu at her. Once in print, in The New Yorker, a famous friend of my father's described a dinner with my father, a Rabelaisian prodigy, and his beautiful, his wife, a beautiful Oriental. She was a Jewish girl of Eastern European descent, born in a small town near Des Moines, Iowa, the oldest of twin girls. She always loved what made her statistically unusual. I have no interest in ordinary people, having met so few of them in my life. Any writer will be asked, why? Why write? Why write this book? What made you do it? If I showed you a photograph of my parents, I think you'd understand. They met in Des Moines at Drake University, then moved from one institution of higher learning or to another. My mother got her doctorate at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. My father would have, but never finished his dissertation. 
They both taught for a while, but eventually ended up at Boston University on staff. We lived in the nearest western suburb. After my father's death, the house became, became my mother's house. After her death, my parents' house again. I don't know when it stopped being my house, though I lived there for 14 years, from second grade till I graduated college. Once I moved away, I disowned the house. I worried about it. The place was a fire trap crammed with stacks of paper, with jazz age wiring and adult painted appliances. I tried not to think about it, but I failed. The house might catch fire and burn to the ground. The fire might sweep through the neighborhood. Some municipal official in my hometown, though I never thought of that place as my hometown, might call to blame me. The head of the Board of Health. If I don't bathe, I'm going to be condemned by the Board of Health, my mother sometimes said. Maybe the mayor would call me up. When I was a kid, the mayor was an exuberant man who, like my mother, was Jewish and dusky, who favored pale suits. And even now, when I hear of a generic mayor, it's him that I see. Kid, he'd say. How could you have let this happen? How could, have you, how could you have allowed your elderly parents to live in this shithole? What choice did I have? I couldn't have them arrested. Also, when I moved out, they weren't elderly. Then they were. My mother liked the story of the Collier brothers, eccentric New York millionaires who collected books and paper and detritus. The way she told the story, one was killed when a pile of books fell over and crushed him. His brother, an invalid, starved to death. She invoked the Collier brothers when she thought my father should get rid of some books or maybe find some shelves for them. Fire, book collapse, flood. At any moment, a disaster could befall my parents, or worse, nothing definitive would happen, and I would have to make an assessment and a decision. No, you cannot live here another day. I don't know where you'll go, but this place will kill you. The house has given you that cough. The house is the reason the wound on your leg won't heal. Wait, you have a wound on your leg, too? The house doesn't love you. The house wants you dead. I love you and want you alive. Easier to blame the house than my parents who let it lapse in this, into the state. Monstrous house. It had eaten my parents and was digesting them. For a long time, my parents got rid of nothing. The room was filled with objects and garbage, luggage and inherited love letters, cats. In my childhood, there had been a lot of animals, four cats and two dogs at the height. But in my parents' older age, it was only ever cats and only ever two. My mother's favorite cats were male and nervous and needed her. Come to mommy, my mother would say to one of them. Yes, I love you too. You are not that cat's mother, I said, sitting on the sofa during a visit. Don't listen to her, said my mother. I won't point out the obvious that my mother never said she loved me because it's academic. My mother loved me, it's not a question. I knew it and she knew it. Her inability to say so felt no different from her inability, her refusal to speak French. Once in a restaurant in Paris, she stubbornly ordered the chicken soup, even though bouillon was a word I'd heard her say dozens of times, followed by the word cube. The closest to a foreign language I ever heard her speak, apart from a smattering of Yiddish, was also really English. When a waiter delivered her plate in Paris, she said, messy, to him. In Rome, grassy. Saying the words was the problem. Love, too. She knew what it meant, even if she couldn't pronounce it. Still, I wish she had stumbled a little in saying it to the cat. My parents were a sight gag. Opposites otherwise, too. One shy but given to monologues, one outgoing and inclined to listen. One with a temper, one affable, sometimes enragingly so. Opposite in every way but their bad habits which is the secret to a happy marriage and also the makings of a catastrophe. Thank you, Elizabeth. I'm going to also just read a little from the beginning so you don't have to know anything about this book. <laughs> and just to hear the person, the narrator's voice. You cannot cut an apple with an apple. You cannot cut an orange with orange. 
You can if you have a knife, cut an apple or an orange, or slice open the underbelly of a fish, or if your hands are steady enough and the blade is sharp enough, sever an umbilical cord. You can slash a book. There are different ways to measure depth, but not many readers measure a book's depth with a knife, making a cut from the first page all the way down to the last. Why not? I wonder. You can hand a knife to another person, betting with yourself how deep a wound he or she is willing to inflict. You can be the inflictor of the wound. One half orange plus another half orange do not make a full orange again. And that is where my story begins. An orange that did not think itself good enough for a knife. An orange that never dreamed of turning itself into a knife. Cut and be cut. Neither interested me back then. My name is Agnes, but that is not important. You can go into an orchard with a list of names and write them on the oranges, Francoise and Pierre and Diane and Louise, but what difference does it make? What matters to an orange is its orangeness. The same with me. My name could have been Clementine or Odette or Henrietta, but so? An orange is just an orange, as a doll is a doll. Don't think that you name a doll. Don't think that once you name a doll, it is different from other dolls. You can bathe it and close it and feed it empty air and put it to bed with the lullabies you imagine a mother should be singing to a baby. All the same, a doll, the doll, like all dolls, cannot even be caught dead, as it was never alive. The name you should pay attention to in this story is Fabian. Fabian is not an orange or a knife or a singer of lullabies, but she can make herself into any one of those things. Well, she once could. She's dead now. The news of her death arrived in a letter from my mother, the last of my family still living in San Remy, though my mother was not writing particularly to report the death, but the birth of her own first great one child. Had I remained near her, she would have questioned why I have not given birth to a baby to be added to her collection of grandchildren. This is one good thing about living in America. I am too far away to be her concern. But long before my marriage, I stopped being her concern. My fame took care of that. America and fame, they're equally useful. If you want to, if you want freedom from your mother, just one more little thing. How do you grow happiness? Fabian asked. We were thirteen then, but we were, felt older. Our bodies, I now know, were underdeveloped, the way children born in wartime and growing up in poverty are, with more years crammed into their brains. Well-proportioned, we were not. Well-proportioned children are the rare. War guarantees disproportion. But during peacetime, other things go wrong. I have not met a child who's not lopsided in some way. And when children grow up, they become lopsided adults. Can you grow happiness, I asked. You can grow anything, just like potatoes. Fabian said. I thought she would have given a better answer, growing happiness on the top of a maypole, or in a wren's nest, or between two rocks in a creek. Happiness should be dirt, happiness should not be dirt colored and hidden underground. Even apples on a branch should be better suited to be called happiness than apples in the earth. Though if happiness were like apples, I thought, it would be quite ordinary and uninteresting. You don't believe me, Fabian said. I have an idea. We grow your happiness as beet and mine as potato. 
If one crop fails, we still have the other. We won't be starved. What if both fail? I asked. We'll become butchers. Such were the conversations we often had then. Nonsense to the world, but the world we already knew was full of nonsense. We might as well amuse ourselves with our own nonsense. If the thumb on the left hand got crushed under a hammer, would the thumb on the right hand feel anything? Why did God never think of giving people ear lids, so we could put our ears, so we could close our ears as we shut our eyes at bedtime, or any time when we were not in the mood for the chattering of the world? If the two of us prayed with equal seriousness, but with the opposite request, "Dear God, please let tomorrow be a sunny day," "Dear God, please let tomorrow be an overcast day," how did he decide which prayer? He should honor. Fabian loved making nonsense about God. She claimed she believed in God. That what she meant, I thought, was that she believed in a God that was always available for her to mock. I did not know if I believed in God. My father was an atheist, and my mother was the opposite of an atheist. If I had, if I had been closer to one or the other, it would be easier for me to choose. But I was only close to Fabian. Perturbatrice of God, she called herself, and said I was one too, because I was always on her side. In that sense, we were not atheists. You had to believe that God existed, so you could make mischief and upend His plans. If we can grow happiness, can we grow misery? I asked her. Do you grow thistles or ragworts? Fabian said, "Do you mean misery grows by itself, like thistles and ragworts, or by God?" Fabian said, "Who knows?" But happiness, can it grow by itself? What do you think? I think happiness should be like thistles and ragworts. Misery should be like exotic orchid. Only an idiot would believe that, Agnes. Fabian said. But we already know you are an idiot. Thank you. <laughs> I have no, we have known each other for twenty one years, and Elizabeth was my professor, one of my first writing teachers in Iowa. Yeah, and I, I, I taught you nothing. You, can't, you came in fully <laughs> formed. That, no. that sounded worse oh, than no. like. And I've just listened to your work, and I taught you nothing. No, I rem I remember reading reading your work and being stunned. Well, contrary to what Elizabeth said, actually, I think I've, everything I learned about writing, I've learned from Elizabeth. And I still write to her all the time asking for advice. If I get stuck, I would ask how to proceed. Yeah. So. 21 years is a long time. Yes. Yes. Can I, we, we were talking we're, earlier yeah. about how somehow we had both written books, um, and we, I hadn't really thought about this because we had exchanged manuscript. Mm -hmm. um, Ewan is one of the most important readers of my work now from a, as, as an early reader. And uh, we both wrote books that are about writers mm -hmm. and about sort of the question of um, what it means to take somebody else's story, sort of what, uh, what, the, what the ethics of claiming that you are the author of a book means. And I'm wondering, and you, you've been writing about writers more lately. Your wonderful last book, Must I Go, is also about a writer um, and about writing. And I wonder if you came to the, the characters first, um, or, and by the way, that line about that just because you give a doll a name Oh. It doesn't make it different from other dolls. And I love that sentence so much. And also it seems be, to be contrary to the question of creating characters. Because we feel deeply, I think, if you give a character a name, it becomes a character, a different character. Yeah, right. different from all other characters. Right. So I wonder if you could just talk about 
how you began writing about right. Agnes and Fabian. Agnes, Fabian. Yeah, so, so yes, I, as Elise was said, I, I realized we have a lot of, you know, that there's a lot of back and forth in both our novels. But my book started really with a, an old review I read. Elisa Bowen reviewed in 1950s. She, re, she reviewed four teen, uh, she reviewed four children or child prodigies from France. And all four of them were under the age 15. I think the youngest was nine. And Francois Segan was already famous at the time, 19. And Bowen said, well, all these kids made Sagan look like a middle-aged woman. <laughs> and so, 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 I, so I, I, I read the review, and one of the, one of the prodigies was, was a f- peasant girl whose name you would probably not find in history. You could find a little bit, of not a lot. So, you know, I, I, I think it's interesting because my character is someone for, who disappeared from history. Well, your character is someone who would never disappear from history. You know, so it's... But I, I think for me, it's, if someone already disappeared from history, I could claim her as my character, and I could do things with her like a doll. <laughs> but I, I think right away I knew that I didn't... It was a literary hoax in the end. You know, the girl disappeared quickly because she actually did not write the book. The post postmaster in the village wrote the book. And... So, so fairly soon she just disappeared, but I, I, I took her story, but I wasn't interested in writing about a hoax. I, I wanted to write about a friendship story or a relationship, a close relationship between two girls. So, so that's how Fabienne and Agnes came. And now I'm going to turn to you, Elizabeth. How did the book, like, when did you start writing the book? And how what do you, what were you thinking when you started? <laughs> I, I started writing it in 2019, which was um, the year after my mother had died. Um, and the, the, the book itself is, it's a novel. It was a novel when I wrote it. But there is the major character of it is somebody who could be nobody else than my own personal mother, Natalie McCracken. Mm-hmm. Um, and I can't be disingenuous. Anybody who met her, she was unlike any other human being. Um, and it's important to me somehow that it's it's my mother. And I was in London, and I was trying to write a story that I could not get off the ground. Mm. And then actually, I, um, I saw my friend Emer McBride, who said that she had just finished writing a little auto-fictional novel called Strange Hotel. Um, she seemed really happy about it. And it <laughs> sounded like so much better than um, the short story about a bad dog that I couldn't, and I, like, I, I had time and space, and every day I woke up and worked on this short story about a bad dog um, and really hated it. Um, and so I started thinking about my mother, and I'd been thinking about her already because I was in London where I'd visited mm-hmm. her, I, visited there with her um, some years before and I think I put I I tried to put out of my head anybody reading the book um, as I started to write it um, so that I could just write about my mother I I, I found early notes in which there's the mother character is nothing like my mother and I couldn't and it's it's quite lifeless and once I made the decision that I wasn't going to worry about a book with my mother as a central character, um, then I yeah then I I, be, I began to go right. Can, can I ask? The, can we talk about the relationship between the daughter and the mother <laughs> in the novel? I mean, I have read the novel a few times, and one thing I find fascinating is, of course, you know, the mother character is larger than life and has all these lives and you know just power and everything but somehow I think that the narrator is it's like a it's like a chess game where the narrator is always ahead of the mother without letting you know she's ahead of the mother I want to I want to hear your talk about the relationship between you know this almost unbalanced relationship you know anytime you have a mother-daughter relationship it's not balanced 
but this one is particularly both unbalanced but extremely balanced in, yeah. a, in a sneaky way. I'll answer this and then, and then I'm going to ask you a question. Yeah. Yes. Um, <laughs> which, I mean, it's such a, it's a really interesting question and the, the answer is about something quite unfair, which is, first of all, my mother would hate the idea that I was ever a step ahead of her in <laughs> any way. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> um, or that I had created a situation. Right. Um, and one of the reasons why it's a novel, I, I, I decided to make the decision that it was a novel when I started writing it. It wasn't that I wrote a book and then tried to decide what I thought it was going to be. Um, and one of the reasons for that is that if it were a memoir, I'd have to write about myself more. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, that it wouldn't, be, it wouldn't be fair or accurate to write a memoir of a daughter's memoir of a mother without putting any of the daughter in it at all. But when you write a novel, you can kind of do what you want. And so I think she is a step ahead, but that's partially because she's revealing the mother, but not revealing herself. I want, so I want to talk about, I mean, there's so many interesting relationships uh, in the Book of Goose. Um, the, the primary one between Agnes and Fabienne, mm -hmm. um, of course, and also then the relationship of the two to the, of them to the postmaster who's, who's right. in the book. And I, I'd love to hear you talk about making the decision to tell the, the story from the, qu the quieter of the girls, even though as, I think as you read the book, and she's saying Fabienne was always the interesting one. She was the interesting right. one. You think, well, you're inter you're, you've sustained a whole amazing novel. <laughs> right, right. You're actually quite interesting. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, that's it's almost the same as the, this author is hiding behind some. Your, I mean, your book, right? The narrator's not telling much about herself, but telling the mother. It's almost you know. I always think a narrator is like someone with a mirror on the shoulder, you know, the narrator goes around to narrate the world, but the way the mirror reflects the world also reflects what the narrator is positioning herself, you know, what the narrator is hiding, where the narrator is hiding, and what she's hiding from. So, uh, yeah, coming back to Agnes and Fabienne, you know, Fabienne is certainly, Fabi so the story, you know, this is not a spoiler, it's very soon you know Fabienne is dead, Fabienne is dead on page one, but when she was younger, she wrote a book, but she made Agnes to be the author of the book, so they could both share something in this book. So Fabienne is more imaginative and has a lot of energy, but I always like muddiness in a character, in a narrator. I think Agnes is quite muddy. You know, she is. She hides herself. She said, "I'm an idiot." Well, everybody thinks I'm an idiot. It's okay because you know she, she has all these statements about herself. You don't know if she believes it or not. I mean, in the end, she turned out to be a very good writer. When she was sent to Paris to meet the publishers, they gave her a test, and she turned out she could write a beautiful passage about the countryside and American occupation. You know, in the French countryside. So. So in a way, but I like her ambivalence about herself and her ambivalence about the world. So in the end, I think a muddy, sort of muddy narrator is always more interesting than a pure, you know, strong voice, major key narrator. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, so I think that's why Agnes is telling the story. Do you think of her as an unreliable narrator? No, I don't think of her as unread. Okay, now I'm going to ask you, do you think you're a narrator? <laughs> oh, for, I mean, I remember this was in your class. You said all first-person narrators are unreliable. It's just a de like, it's a, it's a scope or a range of unreliableness. And I didn't think of Agnes as unreliable narrator only because Fabian is dead. She's coming back to tell the story, to correct the record. And I think the for how many years she did not tell the story it was because there was no reason to correct that record. But now she's coming back to say, I'm going to be on record telling the world why this is a hoax. The hoax is a hoax because of this. So I didn't think she was an unreliable narrator. But now I want to say, <laughs> is your narrator unreliable narrator? Do you think of her as an I don't think of her as an unreliable narrator, the daughter in the, in the book. 
Yeah, I, I don't, although I, I realize I gave you a stealth quiz as your former teacher 21 years later. Like, <laughs> do you remember what I taught you about unreliable yes. narrators? Yes. You well, did. Because so, um, yeah. I do think that that's, for Agnes, one of the things, she's, she's just human. Mm -hmm. She's just present with a soul and that makes, right. I think that's what the muddiness right, is. Right, right. No, but, but your narrator is not, un, but I don't think she's a, an unreliable narrator, but she is, to me, you know, there's a very good line at the beginning of the novel when the, when the narrator walks down in London in an early Sunday morning and big band, uh, not the big band, St. Paul, bell ran, and the narrator turned around and thought there was a, giant elk in the middle of London. And I thought, I, you know, I said that in a review, I said some writers can write about nature, some writers can write about city, only Elizabeth McCracken sees a, an elk in the middle of London. And it's not unreliable, but this is a narrator that has a specific kind of perception. And can you talk about that, that narrator? I'm trying to make a difference between the narrator and the <laughs> author. But can we talk about the narrator's perception of the world? Yeah, I mean, I think, so there's, there's sort of two, well, maybe, I don't know. I'm very bad about talking my, about my own work, which is too bad for you guys, I'm sorry. <laughs> um, so the, the narrator, over the course of the book, the narrator is walking through uh, London and then it, it jumps back into time, time about certain um, events in her relationship with her mother, mostly as an adult. There's not very much childhood in the book. Um, and she, she passes by places she had gone to with, with her mother. And I think there is that sort of, that doubling or tripling or quadrupling when you are in a city where you've been before, where you're sort of simultaneously experiencing all of the other times you've been there. Mm -hmm. And so I think her mind is open in a very particular way, that she's, she's walking through London, but she's also walking through London with her mother, walking through the things that she did with her mother as well. And I, do, I don't think she's unreliable, but I do think she's, um, She's purposely a bit controlling about she, the story she's telling. Yeah, she, she to me is one of those, you know, quintessential. I think actually it's Stan Dars who said that, you know, an author or a narrator is with a shoulder, with a mirror on the shoulder to go out to the to reflect reality. I thought your narrator is particularly good at, you know, she walks around London, she meets a lot of people, she talks to these people. You get a sense, you know, within five seconds she gets stories out of everyone, except nobody actually comes back to say, hey, what's your story? Like, like how does she do that? <laughs> how does she reflect this, you know, as a mirror, just reflect reality, while these people don't even realize they're trapped in her story now? <laughs> yeah, stubbornness. Stubbornness. <laughs> Can you talk a little bit about... She did not answer my question. No, no, that's right. <laughs> I just want... <laughs> I, 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 I guess partially because I don't know the, the answer to that question uh -huh. exactly. Okay. Um, and that I sort of knew that I wanted the, the London part of the book to be about her slipping through the city. Right. Um, and that particularly, you know, she... she identifies herself as being a, a middle-aged woman that in fact it is quite easy to slip through a city um, without without being noticed. It's not painful to her any, right. anyway. In fact, it's a, I think a great pleasure to be able to be the person who at one point she gets caught um, in a the London Eye, the giant um, <laughs> Ferris wheel and the, the cars are capsules and she gets caught in a capsule with a large family. Where's the grandmother celebrating? Yeah, the, yeah her 80th birthday party. Yeah. Um, and you sort of know that when she leaves, they won't think about her again. I, do, I find that moment so fucking, it's so fascinating because, you know, th there are these encounters. You know, these people are immortalized by a writer. Well, they actually did not realize 
someone is watching them, remembering every single detail about the characters or these people. Yeah. Sorry, I know it's stubbornness. Yeah. It's, yeah, I just want to say it's not unreliable narrator, but it's a very sort of sly narrator in a way that she can change the angle of, you know, if, if a reader doesn't pay attention, the reader would all just be reading about other characters rather than this narrator, so. Will, will you talk a little bit about one of the many thrilling things in your book is how vividly you write about childhood? and not about childhood as being a sweet time. And this is, she's telling the story retrospectively years later, but childhood being full of hmm. peril and, and like peril and sex and, you know, that just if you can talk about. Right. That's, y yes. And when you said there's not much childhood in your book, I realized that's a, that's a little bit difference between our books. My Agnes tells the entire story about her childhood, except when they were, when the characters are 13, they would not think of themselves as children. They would not think of themselves as living in a childhood in a French countryside. I think their entire world is just animals running around. You know, one day they are animals, next day they're, you know, cooked. <laughs> <laughs> and babies die human beings die, you know, it's full of violence and, and danger. And, but I think, I, I think the, 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 the reason, you know, it's, it's interesting because I think the characters when they, when they are children, when they live in the middle of that, they would not think of, of themselves as being children living in danger. They would just say, these, are my, you know, this is a, our world, and they don't pay attention to the historical or, you know, either personally historical or historical historical in post-World War, you know, France. They don't think of themselves that way. I think their entire world is complete. And I feel that's one thing that I was, speaking of stubborn, I was very stubborn in just writing about the world from their point of view. You know, if you want to just slip into the history or any, you know, historical in influence or importance into that narrative, it became less natural to me. Mm. So, so I don't think a lot of research even need to be done because you just need, you need to live in their world. And they're just, well, they're, it's are just gold. Let's kill that gold. <laughs> Or, you know, that baby is dead. Let's try, let's touch the dead baby and feel the te dead baby. That's, that's how children function, yeah. So I'm sorry, <laughs> that's very morbid. <laughs> <laughs> well, what, but one of the things that I really love about it is that I, I remember being 13. I live with a 13-year-old uh, girl right now, my daughter, um, and not just some <laughs> random 13-year-old girl <laughs> as roommates in an odd couple sort of situation. Um, <laughs> And one of the things I remember ab about being 13 is just that, that you are a child, but you don't think that you're a child. And it's this strange intersection of being enough of a child to believe deeply in things that you make up, that make-believe is not over when you're 13, but mm. it's vivid and strange. And you're, that's what happens with your characters, except for amazingly, they're able to make something actually happen out of that make-believe world, right, which is thrilling. Yeah, I, you know, it's interesting because you said, you know, as children, I, I think children, they, there are certain words I want, like for instance, in your book, when, when the, ch it's about the same time when the narrator was a teenager or early teens or preteen, a friend came and said, call the mother a cripple. And the narrator was so, sh it was a cripple, right? Yeah. yeah. So the friend said, oh, your mother, I didn't know your mother was a, cri was a cripple. And the narrator was so shocked because I feel, you know, there are certain words that we don't live with those words. We don't mm. live with those definitions. Then we, we don't use them and until someone else came to say, that's what it is. So I think the two girls, they were living in their own world. They're making up stories 
and and to you know Fabian said let's write a book but you know she's she was young she was inexperienced she didn't know if she could make the book until the postmaster thought oh we can sell this book you know you always need an outsider to say this is what we can do this is the word you use for your mother right so so yeah so can I just go I feel someone is whispering about time so can I no oh yeah we should uh no but but let me <laughs> <laughs> it's really nice talking yeah I don't know. I, I, wa I want to talk, I still want to talk about your book, just one more question about the ownership of the story. Mm -hmm. You know, it, it is, the, it's true, the narrator is talking about the mother's story. But in the end, it is the narrator's story. Would you agree? I don't, I don't know. <laughs> this, is, this is my only my second event for this book. And I was like, that's a really good question. I hadn't thought about that. Um, no, I think it is the narrator's story story and I, but I think that her canniness is that she's left most of her own autobiography out of the book right and and I feel that's you know one of the best sort of autobiographical writer writing <laughs> is to leave yourself entirely out of the book and yet we readers know <laughs> or we thought we knew right I think I feel I feel I I know this narrator after reading the book so that's not a question that's a comment <laughs> I, ju I just realized I do that you know when the audience said this right. is not a question this is a comment <laughs> I've I'm, I'm, been making comments so. it's, a, it's that rare stage bound version of a uh, comment not a question <laughs> not a question sorry yeah I'm uh, this question is for you on um, I don't know if I said your name right I'm sorry I've only read it um, my question is, you said you wrote to uh, Elizabeth McCracken with questions, and I was wondering what those questions were and what that back and forth was like. Oh, yes. So Elizabeth can give a version of that answer, <laughs> too. But, well, I, 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 for instance, was when I was working on this book, I think the earlier drafts was much longer. And, and I think one of the questions I did ask Elizabeth was, well, you know, I, I can't because you haven't read the novel, so you don't know. But in the end, in the first draft, Fabian just disappeared from the novel, and so I just showed the manuscript to Elizabeth and said, <laughs> "Does that work?" I think Elizabeth was very, very tactfully told me, <laughs> "You can't have this narrator disappear. <laughs> you, you can't have those major characters disappear from the book." Is that what she said? Yeah. Maybe. I think so. But uh, oftentimes it's just, you know, sometimes I think, like, it is when I have known each other, we've been friends for so long, but still, I feel that when I get confused, I just need to ask Elizabeth so she can get rid of those confusion in my head. Does that make sense? Yeah, I think you often ask me questions that somebody else has said about your work, and you actually know your opinion. Oh, right. And you ask me, and whatever I say is your opinion already. Right. So that's <laughs> sort of like, and I actually do feel as a, um, I, I don't know how you feel about this. We now we both teach creative writing, but I feel like my, the biggest thing that I can give to students is permission mm. to do the things that they would like to do. And I think that's still, if you ask me a question, you think my editor said this. What do you think? Uh, no. Right. Um, yes, it is. With don't do that. Yeah. And I think it's very good. You know, you, you know, when you write, you have a couple of voices, and there's one <laughs> sort of fairy godmother voice here, <laughs> which is Elizabeth's voice. <laughs> so, this is a question for Elizabeth. I, I I love the title, the hero of this book, and I guess I'll have to read it to find out who I think the hero of this book mm -hmm. is. But did the title come first, or mm -hmm. or did it just crystallize out of writing it? It didn't come first. This is the first book I've ever written that I didn't title myself. I'm usually, I take mm -hmm. titles very seriously. They seem like, I, I often struggle with a book if I don't have the, t the title for it. And it was called um, Look How I Go, which is a line from Midsummer Night's Dream that Puck says. It's actually in the book. The book was a about uh, the mother has difficulty walking. She also died. I, I was so thrilled with this title that had multiple meanings. 
Um, and then my editor pointed out that it, if you don't, you have to read the book for the, the, that pleasure and that it was, um, that it was not working for her. And I was also aware that it was quite similar to a title of uh, Yun's book, um, Must I Go? And I, there was part of me that was sort of like, I think I actually asked you, I said, how do you, what do you think? Is that right. too close? And you were very nice. You said, no, it's not too close, <laughs> but I'm happier not having my title. Um, and my, my editor came up with the title, which is a phrase mm -hmm. that's in the book. And, and I was thrilled with it. And partially one of the things that I like about it is that the book is very um, self-reflexive and talks about itself as a, as a book. Um, so yeah, I think it fit. You, I, you always wanted to have a book called The Book of Goose, or did you, you came up with a... I came up with a title before I came up with a story, only because I love goose. I love geese. I love goo the animal thing. <laughs> yeah, and so I did start with a title. But I want to just comment on this hero, the, the, the hero of this book. It really reminds me of Thomas Hardy's bo uh, book called Life's Little Ironies. Mm. You know, I, I feel those two titles are probably my most favorite two titles. The hero of this book, Life's Little Ironies. Life's little ironies are full of deaths. If, if you could see me slightly fixing Yun with a, a, a stare about talking about her love of geese. Oh, yes. Uh, um, so I was attacked by geese <laughs> recently, and it was very, it's, yeah, it's uh, inherently funny. I don't know why, but <laughs> it is. I laugh when I tell the story. But I, had, I swim early mornings in Austin, and I would report to Yun every day about some geese who were there. And then she was coming to Austin, and I don't know why I'm telling this story, except for it's very important That's to me that everybody knows that I've been attacked by geese. Um, and I saw new geese, and I thought, oh, this is so wonderful. I will, I'm gonna, it's a good sign. I'm gonna tell you, Yun, there are these new geese, and the next thing I knew, these geese I'd never seen before were attacking me. <laughs> and the next day, we had talked about going to swim in this pool, and we went, and the geese were up on the hill, and um, I remember, you know, being looking at them, and we were standing outside. And she said, "They're beautiful. I'm sorry, villains can be beautiful." <laughs> <laughs> and I think I said, "They're ugly inside." Um, but I, I do. And then we were at a party the next day where they made up a drink called Goose Attack. Um, in honor of <laughs> both honor, of us. To honor. Yes. Ian wrote a, a stunning, astonishing book with a goose in it, and uh, I was attacked by two geese. Attacked by, and, and now we look at geese everywhere. Yeah. yeah. Uh, pause it also. I have not read these books, so I can't comment on the books themselves, but it does sound like both books are a little bit about, or about characters looking at an, another character, and I feel like Right now, we exist so much in this world where people are like looking at themselves so intensely, um, and I'm curious, like, if you feel, as writers, that there's a need to encourage people to examine the people around them, or to make a record of that, or I don't know. It's, it's like That's not even a comment. Yeah, I do, I do think I do think that. I mean, not. To, I'm not. I want to make clear. There's no book that I keeping in mind when I say this, but that sometimes when I read novels that are nothing but interiority, they feel quite airless to me. And one of the things that I think makes writing and reading worthwhile is that sort of the strange charge of other people and trying to figure out what other people are, are thinking and, and what that means. Right. And I also think Elizabeth and I are probably two writers who really hate to look at ourselves <laughs> all the time. <laughs> We're both outward looking authors. But I agree. I, I mean, I know exactly what you mean. You know, it's oh, I mean, in a way, I, I think Elizabeth probably would agree with me. There are two kinds of writers. One is they like to sit, you know, center stage, you know, all the lights on this writer. I think that's fine, but wouldn't that be nice if we sit there and just <laughs> watch us, you know, say, look at those two women, they're so funny. <laughs> they're, they're also so strange. <laughs> you know, I, 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 I think there's some joy, you know, being invisible, and then you can't just, 
in talking about being invisible, I think that narrator in Elizabeth's novel is largely invisible to the entire London. <laughs> it was just astonishing. I just thought there's not, you know, it's interesting, but that's a skill. I think that's also a trick, right? Yeah. Would you agree? I, yeah, I would. And I, uh, yeah, I, I, those, we know some of those writers who love to be in the center and, and they're really fun at parties until they become no fun at parties. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, no, I think we're we're both. Yeah, yeah. We're we're out we'll go. Yes. You mentioned Hardy, um, and I'm wondering whether you could tell us uh, some of your favorite novelists uh, of the past and the present. Right. One each. Please. One each. <laughs> you. You. I went first last time. Oh. Oh. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, I. I uh, well, you know, and I, I read just, I reread. I, I do more rereading than reading. So some of my rereading are just, you know, they're just Tolstoy, I reread him all the time. Moby Dick, I reread it all the time. Shakespeare, I, you know. So these are, and then there are, you know, just a bunch of writers like Edith McCracken. But it's, it, I, I would define these writers as uh, they're women writers who are quite mischievous. <laughs> and, and they, you know, I think I, I count Elisa Bowen in it, Elisa McCracken, Elisa Bowen, Elizabeth Taylor. <laughs> I mean, these, all these Elizabeths, I, I, I think those are all my favorites. And I'm, I'm done. Your <laughs> turn. <laughs> I got three Elizabeths in. Um, I always, I'm one of those people that when people say, what books do you like? I, my immediate reaction is, I can't remember ever having read a single book. <laughs> um, though I also like, I always, I think the heart that just like there's the Beatles Rolling Stones split, the Hardy Dickens split, and I'm on the side of Dickens in mm. that. I, I like Hardy well enough, but Dickens is a writer of my heart. I will also say Yun Lee, <laughs> yes. one of my favorite writers. And we were talking, we were talking about contemporary writers that um, we love their work just earlier um, at dinner. And um, the two people, living writers who I thought of are, were Edward P. Jones and Jeanette Winterson, who are people who, who their, their books um, I reread and, and and uh, and love. <laughs> like that. We can't clap for ourselves, but we can encourage you guys to clap. Down the I think we are. <laughs> I, I think it's perfect time. Yes. Yes. Thank you. Well, very thank much. you very much for coming. <laughs>